for a few seconds. Let's wait a few people to come in. Okay, maybe I can start. What do you think? You ready? Wait a few seconds. Hi everyone, welcome to the last session of today, genome folding and dynamics session. First speaker is Kirill Polovnikov. Okay, thank you very much organizers for organizing this great gathering of biophysicists. Uh, of different minded biophysicists, some of, some of you do not believe in loop extrusion, some of you do which is very nice. We have opportunity to exchange and to discuss in a quite fair and uh, objective atmosphere, quite friendly. So uh, my name is Kirill Palovnikov. I'm an assistant professor at Skoltiak in Moscow. Um, and today uh, I'm, I'd like to present uh, you our recent project with Leonid Mirny from MIT, uh, which was actually started when I was uh, on a postdoc at, at MIT with, with Leonid. Uh, and it was finished just uh, just several months ago. Uh, so it's about uh, folding. Yeah. So our our model of uh, how interface chromosomes are folded. Uh, so the model is called crumpled polymer with loops, and we pretend that it recapitulates key features of interface chromosome organization. Um, so it. It doesn't work. Ah, you should press twice. Okay, this one is also. No, this, this did not work. Ah, it's okay, it's done. Yeah, sorry for this moment. Um, yeah, just a brief disclaimer, what we're looking at, we're looking at the interface, uh, interface chromatin. Yeah, so all of you uh, know that there are two stages, roughly, roughly two, mitotic uh, and interface stage. During mitosis, cells preparing themselves to, to divide, and it can be uh, further structured into several, several sub-stages. But uh, the, main st the main stage of cell cycle is interface, and in this stage, chromosomes look expanded, they occupy the whole volume of nucleus, uh, pretty much like an ideal gas, but it's not an ideal gas. Uh, and we're interested uh, in, for the purpose of this talk, I'll be talking only about interface chromosomes and the model we're proposing for that. Uh, and so that's the main message of my talk, that during the interface, each chromosome that you can see here, they form this famous chromosome territories, each chromosome uh, can be roughly described by a crumpled polymer with randomly positioned loops on top. So uh, that's a message, I'll, I'll explain what does it mean, uh, but just for the, for the purpose of outline, first I will provide some insights from polymer physics, explaining some key concepts, then I'll turn to the experimental data, and finally I'll try to marry some uh, discrepancies between models and experimental data to, to come up with a new uh, model. Okay, so the main, uh, the main strange word in the title uh, is crumpled. So what does it mean? Yeah, crumpled, all, all of you are quite aware with crumpled uh, pieces of paper, but what does it mean for, for polymer physics? Uh, so it deals, this concept deals with topology, with topological interactions in polymer systems. Uh, why should one, met, one should, uh, should one bother about topological interactions? Uh, suppose you have two unknotted uh, and non-catenated rings, uh, and they are put together into one dense system. Uh, so quite clearly, because of this uh, topological invariance of two rings, uh, they cannot come into the catenated situation, and this simple, this simple fact uh, greatly reduces the number of uh, available configurations for these two rings in, in, in the phase space, and that creates the effect of uh, uh, repulsion between the rings, which uh, of purely entropic nature, 
but uh, this entropic repulsion is related with the topological invariance of each of the polymer chains. Um, so this, uh, this simple um, physical fact uh, have uh, much long-standing uh, consequences for, for the system of such chains. So there is a big difference between amount of linear chains, as a classical system in polymer physics, and amount of not ring chains. So the only difference uh, between the two systems is that in the first case we have linear chains with open ends. In the second system, uh, the ends are closed, and we additionally require that every, every ring here is unknot and non-continuated with other rings. Yes, and if you, if you then try to simulate these two systems, uh, you'll see that, okay, in the first case, which is classical, and we know much about it from uh, polymer textbooks, uh, each of these chains adopts uh, a conformation of a Brownian trajectory with fractal dimension two. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, you, you don't see here uh, the exponent, but this exponent uh, of the contact probability is three half. Uh, so it's the same as, a, as the return probability exponent of a random walk. Yeah, so it's a simple thing. But when it comes to rings, uh, it's not so simple. So uh, it, according to many, many different simulations and some phenological theories, each of these rings adopts a self-similar configuration uh, with fractal dimension three in three-dimensional space. And the probability of contact exponent is close to one. So it's completely different from three half uh, for the system of linear chains without topology. Okay, and just, for, just to understand why it's one, why it's not three half or any other exponent, there is a quite known uh, mean field argument uh, that basically says that in order to, uh, in order to have the, the, uh, the, uh, the other end of the segment of length S close to the, to the first end of the segment, uh, it should occupy, uh, it must occupy of order of one cells around the given one, while the total available volume for the segment, for the, for the, for the other end, is of order of the volume of the system, of, of the segment. So the contact probability uh, uh, between the ends of, of the segment is one over volume, and then you can simply connect it to the, uh, to the fractal dimension. So to the, to the radius, to the typical size of the segment, and to connect the two exponents together, uh, and that's a hand-waving like, phenological argument uh, becomes uh, precise in the case where uh, the density, uh, the density for the vector connecting to to ends of the segment uh, is distributed according to the Gaussian. It's not necessarily the ideal chain; it can be any dispersion in this Gaussian. But uh, so this argument comes just uh, from the from the uh, normalization factor of this Gaussian distribution effect. Okay, and then we can apply uh, this argument for our systems. For the system of linear chain with fractal dimension two, it gives the famous minus three half, while for the system of ring with fractal dimension three, it gives minus one. So it's a very, very straightforward arg argument, uh, which is well known in the field, yes? Uh, but uh, now we want to apply these models to the data. So what's about chromosomes? Yeah, chromosomes are also polymers, and we can ask the same uh, question. What is fractal dimension of those polymers? What is the contact probability exponent of those polymers? And uh, how we can relate real chromosomes to, to one of those two models that I present you. Uh, so for that, we have a very nice technology called HiC. c Matthias uh, explained in detail, Matthias, sorry, uh, about this technology, and other people also mentioned it many, many times. So it's been uh, developed uh, roughly 15 years ago already by my collaborator, Job Decker. Uh, uh, it has some complex biochemistry behind, but eventually what it produces uh, is a, gi uh, a giant matrix uh, of probabilities of contact between any two pairs of genomic loci. So here you can see the matrix uh, of probabilities for, for, for one chromosome. And you can see that there are lots of features, and uh, many speakers before me discussed those features, of biophysical mechanisms behind, behind those features and so on, and that's indeed uh, the case, we have lots of features here. Uh, you can compare the two maps, uh, the high sea map and a Google Earth map, and I guess it doesn't work uh, for some reason. Yes, it doesn't work here, 
but if you, if you simultaneously zoom in the two maps, you can see that when you reach a scale of one nucleosome in high C map, you reach the two, two meters resolution in the Google Earth map. So they have the same depth, roughly the same depth. Yeah, so that, that shows you that how, many, how many features are there and how complex this uh, system is, in fact. But we can take the physicist approach and uh, kind of average all the biological details, all the epigenetics in this map uh, by computing P of S. Yeah, the same quantity that I presented to you on the second slide. And for that, you just average the probabilities along a specific diagonal, uh, say with number S. You just average, take the arithmetic mean. Yes, and what you get is the uh, reflection of the average uh, uh, average uh, state, typical, typical state of a, of a polymer at the given contour, contour distance. Yeah, how the special, uh, special size is related to the, to the contour size and how the, uh, the eventual contour probability at the specific uh, contour size is related to the, to, to the size. Yeah. So very simple, but using this very simple operation with the data, you can compute the quantity of interest for physicists. Yes, and that's how the data looks like. So well, that's the result. For, for different high sea experiments, we can see that uh, P of S stretches in three orders of magnitude in S with exponent minus one. So there is one caveat in this data, that this data I'm showing you is uh, for the case without cohesion. So cohesion was first depleted from the nucleus, and then uh, high sea was done. And that's the curve that we will, we will get. Quite fractal state in three orders of magnitude, which resembles a crumpled global uh, model. Okay, uh, and that's a very nice uh, result for polymer theory because actually this fact was predicted in 1993 by Shura Grossberg, and now we we are happy to see this validated, uh, amazingly validated in three orders of magnitude using modern uh, modern experimental technologies. Okay, uh, but then one can answer the question, okay, uh, it's crumpled global, it's topological interactions, but we don't have Hamiltonian of topological interactions. So how can one deal, uh, how can one describe chromosomes as long as they are stabilized by topological interactions? We don't have a good model in polymer physics for that. So uh, to solve this, uh, some, uh, five years ago, six years ago, together with Sergei Nchaev and Mikhail Tam, we propose the effective Hamiltonian to, uh, to reproduce the fractal statistics of topologically stabilized polymer chains, such as Grampot Global. For that, we consider the class of quadratic Hamiltonians. And we've shown that by tuning the decay of the couplings in this Hamiltonian, one can reproduce any fractal dimension of the chain at equilibrium between two and infinity. So uh, you, you choose the parallel decay of the couplings, and if gamma is large enough, larger than three, or if uh, there is only nearest neighbors interactions, like in the Rouse model, uh, fractal dimension is two, like in the ideal chain case. But when uh, these coefficients decay sufficiently slow, then one can reproduce any fractal dimension. And in particular for fractal dimension three, one should choose the, the decay with exponent eight third. And the fractal dimension of the chain at equilibrium would, would be the same as in the crumpled global model. So that's the way uh, how to describe the fractal, uh, fractal dimension of, the, of those chains. Uh, and the important thing there that it works in any space dimension, so it's compatible with string theory, which is rather good. Um, but okay, then one can ask, what happens in, in the wild type chromosomes? So if we don't deplete cohesion, what happens? Then uh, according to their data sets, one can see that there is a shoulder at, the, at, the, at some scale, so this behavior is not fractal anymore. Okay, and one can even better see this effect and how universal it is. If one takes the logarithmic derivative of the contact probability, then uh, different cell types uh, uh, exhibit this uh, peak and deep shape of log derivative, which looks so universal across different cell types, so that we ask, can be this universal shape due to loops? Uh, and of course, uh, we knew for quite a while about loops that cohesion is apparently responsible for making loops on chromosomes via the famous loop extrusion mechanism proposed by Leonid Mirny. It's quite a complex dynamical mechanism of uh, binding and unbinding of, uh, of cohesion, interaction with CCF factors, other factors, and so on. 
Uh, but uh, important thing that it was uh, uh, confirmed in in vitro experiments that cohesin can indeed extrude loops, uh, but it was yeah it was done by two groups and the papers were published uh, almost at, at one time in December 2019. Uh, it was great, but that was in vitro confirmation. So what about in vivo? Can we find the evidence of loops in chromosomes in in vivo? Uh, so I see the in vivo data. So that's why we uh, decided to come up with the, an extension of the Crumple Global Model uh, in order to reproduce the uh, high C data, which is in vivo, and try to find the loops there. Yeah? So we proposed a minimal model for, uh, for a Crumple Global with loops. We said that let's uh, take a look at this loop extrusion process in the steady state picture, where we have fixed loops. They do not change, the, and we have some crumpled conformation of a chain with fixed loops of certain size lambda, uh, typical size lambda of the loop and typical size spacer uh, connecting the, the neighboring loops, G. Uh, but we let those loops and spacers be random. So they're randomly distributed in length and in the position along the chromosome. And that's how our theory reproduces the experimental data. So quite, quite remarkable. Uh, that's a micro C data set from uh, human fibroblast cells and we were able to reproduce it using certain parameters of our model, lambda, typical loop size, and typical uh, gap size 90 in KB. Okay, just to give you a short overview of how we solve this model, this is a totally analytical model, so it can be solved analytically. We have two types of disorder in the system, loops and uh, fluctuations, thermal fluctuations, which introduce disorder. And similarly to spin glasses, we can change the order of the averaging and get different results. Uh, so for this model, we have, uh, we have to first average over temporal, uh, sorry, thermal uh, fluctuations uh, and only at the last stage average over the disorder of loops. So first we can, what we can do is to write down P of S as the average over loops disorder uh, of some quantity, yes? And then we need to understand that loops and gaps can be mapped on the two-state Markov process uh, where first you have a loop, then gap, and all these lengths uh, of loops and gaps are random, randomly distributed with exponential distribution, because that's a feature of two-state Markov process. So that's, that's, what, that's where we use our assumption of exponential distribution of lengths of loops and gap. Okay, uh, and then this in, inner quantity can be decomposed into four different scenarios, four different diagrams, as we call it, and we compute the thermal averages for each of, the, of these diagrams specifically, and then eventually average over the, over the loop disorder using the known weights for the two Markov process. So that's, that's how it's done behind, okay? And as a result, uh, uh, so what does it mean? We, we manage to reproduce with our simple polymer physics model, we manage to reproduce the behavior of experimental data of, uh, in, which is in vivo and which is uh, real chromosomes, uh, which first tells us that uh, uh, loops are there in, in vivo uh, which is the first evidence of loops in, in vivo data. And second, it allows us to estimate typical loop sizes and loop densities from the data. Okay, then you can also, uh, if you look close to this data, to this comparison, you can see that there are some non-universal features at small scales, which we think uh, uh, related to, the, to different capture radii in different high C experiments. And we're now working on the extension of our model to take this into account and reproduce. Okay, uh, and, and the final thing, I don't think I have time, like, yeah, just, just for the one minute. Uh, uh, I'd like to, to dwell on the fact, additional surprising, quite surprising fact for us that we found at the end of our research, our project, that loops not only change the way how P of S behaves, not only create, create this sign shape or the log, log derivative, but they also affect the topological properties of the crumple chain. So as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, topological behavior or fractal dimension three in the system of rings starts from some seeding, from some minimal length scale, which is called the entanglement length. So what we found is that addition of loops to the crumple chain increases this entanglement length uh, and it can increase it depending on the loop density uh, uh, like three times, four times. So it's a really huge increase. So if we compare to the, uh, to the parameters, 
that we found the result is like 10 times, 10 fold increase in, in entanglement length. Uh, so we had a theory uh, uh, that connects the density of entanglements to the parameters, uh, like loop density and volume density of the polymer. And we have a nice confirmation of our theory with computer simulations. So yeah, here you can see that for loop density free, we have uh, almost six-fold increase in the entanglement length uh, with chain. Yeah, so, so just to sum up, that's our picture of uh, wild type and cohesion depleted chromosomes. Uh, without cohesion, uh, chromosomes are well described by a crumpled global model proposed by Grossberg in 1993. But the wild type system is, uh, requires additional, uh, additionally requires loops which can be randomly distributed and we thought that it's produced via the loop exclusion mechanism. And yes, with that I'd like to thank my collaborators especially uh, Sergey Bilan from the Landau Institute and Leonid Mirny from MIT. Uh, Institute Curie and PSL where part of this work was done and the Russian Science, Science Foundation. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you again, Kirill. will be Samuel Pio Lipani. Yes. Okay, so um, hello everyone, I am Samuele and uh, will be talking today about my very first steps about my PhD project that I'm doing at Institut Curie in Paris and it will be about uh, polymer modeling of local chromosome dynamics and what's the role of, of memory and, and, and viscosity in it. But before delving into the main topic, I would like just to uh, sum up a bit of the uh, ideas that have been uh, largely um, talked about today, uh, like for example the fact that uh, the genome uh, folds at very different scales uh, within the nuclei of cells and in particular uh, what we are interested in is the rightmost part of this picture that is referring to loops and so what are loops and what is loop extrusion. I mean, you already know it, uh, because today people talked about it, but I didn't want to lose the opportunity of, of playing with my cable of my phone, just to, <laughs> just to say um, how, these, uh, how this process works. Uh, for instance, if you have, for example, cohesin in, in the nucleus, it can at some point bind in certain uh, locus of, uh, of the genome, and uh, uh, it, oops, sorry. <laughs> It um, uh, brings close together uh, far regions of uh, the DNA by forming a so-called uh, loop. And this loop slowly increases its size, so it goes from a smaller size to a bigger one until it reaches some blocks and then uh, the cohesin disappears and the polymer relaxes back. So it can be represented also by this uh, pictorial picture here in uh, at, in the, at right, and we see that the loop is this uh, red dot, and dynamically it moves uh, towards the point where uh, the polymer finally relaxates back. So something very interesting about extrusion is that uh, it's very sensitive to force. Uh, it has been proved and uh, demonstrated experimentally in vitro by uh, Decker, uh, oops, sorry, uh, Decker Lab uh, that extrusion rate uh, that you can see here in this uh, left plot depends on force and uh, the velocity, so the velocity of extrusion decreases when we increase uh, the force to which the polymer is subjected to. And uh, so a um, plausible question can be what is then the full force profile of uh, of, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this process, in this active process. And why? Because there can be, for example, two reasons. The first one is that uh, the force to which the polymer is subjected to in this region, that is the one after the extrusion and after the block of uh, cohesin that is at the basis of the loop, is different from the force 
to which is subject, the polymer is subjected to at the extremes no? part of the, of the polymer. It is uh, intuitive, but also because uh, since it, it is an active, pro active process, then all the laws and relations that have been found in equilibrium statistical mechanics are not valid anymore. So, well, while uh, before we saw that uh, there have been experiments in vitro, we can actually in our lab uh, do experiments in, in vivo. How? By pulling physically chromatin in the nucleus of cells, uh, by using this technique that has been uh, uh, provided by um, our lab, Coulomb lab, that is uh, the so-called magnetic pulling. And what we do is that we inject some ferritin particles in the nucleus. They bind uh, to a certain locus and then uh, after applying a magnetic uh, field to the system, we can actually measure the force to which is subjected this, uh, this locus. Okay, so we can have, uh, we have a theory to explain this full force profile that we, you see here that uh, at the, by approaching the border of, uh, of the loop, uh, force slowly increases and then it inverts its sign, okay, and it's uh, symmetric, but there can be also other, uh, other important questions as, as further perspectives, like what is the full force profile that we see in function of the extrusion velocity, for example, or in function of the viscosity elasticity of the environment or uh, uh, in function of some externally applied tension or what if we included several extruders in the system so not only one uh, uh, cohesion but multiple so what can be the effect of it uh, so I would like now to uh, thank my team in Paris and also if you uh, want to uh, know more about the project uh, about the methods uh, that I will be developing please contact me or uh, talk to me offline and Thanks also to you, the audience, to be listening to my very short talk. Thanks. No. You mean here? No, no, we, here we are, not, um, we are not seeing loop extrusion. It's just, uh, it's just because, uh, yes, it's just a technique that we can use uh, that has been already used to pull the chromatin in the nucleus, but we could test uh, what we uh, would like to see that is basically loop extrusion in further experiments. So it's something that is still in developing. Uh, no, but I mean the purpose of also my project is to see and develop uh, um, with the same experimental technique uh, ways for a observing loop, uh, loop extrusion. Here is just uh, measuring the force to which the polymer is subjected to without uh, really focusing on, uh, on loop extrusion. But it will be a further, uh, yeah, further development. No, then of course we have the assumption that it can be loop extrusion, but yeah. And then. The goal is to observe it, yes. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, actually, the tension is, uh, is here in this case, a an external magnetic field, and uh, it is one point that is targeted by this ferritin, and uh, it's this one point that is pulled in the chromatin in the nucleus. So it's not a force that is stretching, the polymer, but we are pulling it uh, by using this external magnetic field. The particle is uh, ferritin, so it goes through the nucleus, chromatin goes through the nucleus. It's this external, uh, this external force uh, that is uh, coming from the magnetic field, no? and then uh, it takes into account uh, the resistance of, uh, of the medium uh, and uh, the inner elasticity of, uh, of the polymer, but then the one that is externally applied is the one coming from uh, the intensity, the magnitude of the magnetic field that we know beforehand. Yes. 
Yes, that's why it's the initial steps. Yeah. Yes, this, uh, yeah. Mm -mm. So, thank you for the questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am I am Michele, and uh, I work uh, at the IIT uh, in the RNA System Biology Group, held by Gian Gaetano Tartaglia. And today I'm going to speak about a um, liquid liquid phase separation predictor that um, that we have developed and uh, and can be used uh, um, can be used by everybody uh, through the web server that uh, I'm going to present. Uh, we know that uh, uh, protein can go uh, through different kind of uh, aggregation processes as uh, liquid solid phase transition that uh, are generally toxic and uh, since uh, uh, and, uh, and irreversible, irreversible processes and uh, on the other hand they can go through uh, liquid liquid phase separation that can be toxic or also functional for the cell. Um, for this reason, uh, not for beyond this, uh, it is also uh, possible to think uh, to design molecules or protein that uh, do liquid liquid phase separation in order to uh, develop uh, uh, new tissues, for instance, or a new way to delivery uh, to drug delivery in the system. Our framework to build this predictor is. Um, is a statistical framework, and we start from idea that each each protein can be described uh, through a certain number of features, uh, chemical physical features that come from the sequence, for instance, but also uh, from uh, from the structure. Uh, and since now, with uh, with the rising of alpha fold, we are uh, we have the possibility of uh, having whatever structure we want. Uh, uh, we introduce also the, this kind of layer uh, in the system. And the idea is that uh, uh, building a data set uh, of positives, so protein that goes under phase separation and negatives, and uh, for uh, the sake of time, believe that we did it uh, in a very careful way, um, we uh, train uh, different kind of uh, classificators from uh, classical linear classificators to, uh, to neural networks using a certain feature selection uh, method, and, th and then we valid our predictions uh, in experimental data in different organisms, and also using um, uh, um, fluorescence uh, uh, images from the protein atlas database. And moreover, we can uh, design a profile through the sequence where uh, we can identify the uh, region of the sequence that are able, that drive the liquid liquid phase separation. And moreover, we are able to score mutants. And uh, uh, our, uh, our uh, predictor uh, for the classification task works uh, at the moment uh, um, in independent test set as the best uh, uh, with respect with the other uh, uh, with the other methods, and moreover, uh, we outscore uh, uh, the other methods, especially in uh, classifying uh, uh, liquid liquid phase separation protein observed in, uh, in other organisms um, that uh, are not where the proteins are not used uh, in the training set. Um, to, um, to define uh, a profile of liquid of liquid liquid phase separation along the sequence, uh, we tackle the problem using a sliding window over the sequence and taking each of this uh, of this uh, of this piece, and we score giving a number between zero and one. That is the probability that that kind of peptide will go under liquid liquid separation. Going through all the sequence, we are able to generate a, a profile. We test. We, we test this uh, in a, using um, an experimental data, uh, an experimental uh, data set where uh, are uh, reported the regions that drive liquid liquid separation in, 
in proteins, and uh, we have good, uh, good score. And moreover, using uh, information from the profiles, we are able to score mutations. So we are able to say if a mutation increases or uh, decreases uh, liquid-liquid phase separation, having a very good score, especially recognizing mutations that are highly prone to increase liquid-liquid uh, phase separation. With this, uh, we have this uh, web server that can be used, uh, uh, is, an, uh, is open source and can be used by any, uh, everybody, where you introduce, uh, you have to introduce or a PDB or a FASTA file, uh, and uh, if you introduce a PDB, you will get a 3D structure colored with the LLPS propensity along it, the score, so the probability that the protein goes under phase separation, and the profile along the sequence. For the FASTA file, you have the profile and the score, but also you can generate a mutagenesis analysis where per, uh, uh, along the sequence, per each position, we mark the possible amino, possible amino acid substitution, and with this heat map, you know where uh, uh, the system, uh, the, the mutation would improve or uh, reduce uh, the, the condensation ability. With this, I, I conclude. I thank Jonathan Fiorentino that uh, did this work uh, together with me, and Gian Gaetano as well, and the other part uh, of the group in Genova and Rome. The features are chemical, uh, physical features, for instance, the hydrophobicity, the uh, disorder, and uh, whatever kind of sequence features, <coughs> sequence based features that we can uh, achieve, or structural features like percentage of alpha helix, or whatever. Yes, of course, through, through the classification task and through the last, through the, um, and through the, through the, through the, say, through the framework, you, we rank the ability and we, the importance is, and we, take care of the fact that it needs to have an uh, interpretability. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Okay, let me see. Okay, so let me thank the organizers for this very nice meeting and for allowing me to... Okay, now I'm learning how to use this. And for allowing me a long talk slot, you will realize soon I'm a slow speaker. So to play my collaborator safe, I already acknowledge them. So this work was done in collaboration with all colleagues of mine in the Department of Physics and Astronomy in Padua, Marco. And recently, Leonardo Salicari, a PhD student I'm supervising. Here is, you can see a list of papers that we have been publishing along these lines of entangled motifs in protein structure. In this talk, I will focus on this one, and will tell you about the detection of non-covalent lasses in protein structures. Maybe some quick flash about their presence in membrane proteins, and then the last part on folding mechanism for a small entangled proteins. Okay. Luckily, we had before the coffee break a very nice introduction to the energy landscape theory, which is a well-known paradigm in, uh, in protein folding. So uh, natural protein sequences uh, minimize energetic frustration in order to have reproducible folding into the native state. On the other hand, some amount of residual frustration may occur connected to biological function, which can be measured through the 
for Statometer server, server, as we heard before. I will be concerned with what is known as topological frustration. So another important point is that the native topology, so the three-dimensional structure of the protein, typically dictates the folding kinetics, also in regards of topological frustration, which refers to the fact that if the order of events that should take place for the folding to proceed is wrong, then the folding process may result in some kinetic trap or kinetic bottleneck. So this paradigm was challenged, say, already 25 years ago when it was found that uh, protein structure can host knots and this stimulated an enormous amount of work both on the theory side and on the experimental side. Uh, one can ask which would be the functional role of knots. As far as I understand, there is no really clear answer except for saying that they provide some kind of mechanical stability to the structure. The point I want to make is that they are kind of rare in the PDB structure that we know experimentally, so some few percent, only a few percent of structures will, will, will form knots. On the other hand, more recently, the group of Joanna Salkowska in Warsaw, they found a new class of entangled motifs in proteins, but they, uh, in part, so other than complex lasso, but I, I will focus in this talk on complex lasso. And they found uh, examples of this kind of lasso structures where you have a lasso closed by two cysteins forming a disulfide bridge, so these are covalent lasso, and a, another portion of the chain threading through it. Okay, so what we did was to generalize this to the case of non-covalent lasso. So now the two uh, residues which close the loop are not cysteine, so they form a weak non-covalent contact. And so this contact may be easily broken. And so this implies that this is very different from a knot. So this is not a knot in topology in general because you can just break the content and, that's, and then you're back to some unknotted, uh, so you are in an unknotted topology. Okay, so how do we detect non-covalent lassos, entangled motifs? We use uh, essentially the linking number, so for two closed curves, uh, this integral is the linking number, is an integral value, which is, uh, if it is not zero, it signals the presence of concatenation. What we did was to, uh, we proposed to, to use a generalization of this indicator to open and discretize curves. In this way, we don't get any more integral values, but we will get continuous values. So more specifically, so we look at pair of uh, portions of a, prot of, of a given protein chain where one portion is a loop, it will be in red in what follows, so with the two yellow residues closing the loop, and a blue <coughs> portion of a chain which might be threading through this loop to form a non-covalent lasso. And essentially we can attach an indicator for this entanglement to any given loop by, so now the red curve is fixed and we maximize this quantity, so the absolute value of the generalized Gaussian integral, uh, generalized linking number if you wish, for all possible choice of this blue curve. And we will say that this loop is entangled if this number is larger than one. But note that, okay, so in this maximization process we are considering the absolute value, but these numbers come with a sign, and we do have a natural arrow along a protein chain from the end to the C terminal, so we will also deal with the sign of this number. And then we can maximize over all possible entangled loops, and we will assign a number to a protein. So uh, uh, an entangled, an indicator telling us whether a protein hosts an entangled motif. So the first crucial point in my presentation is that non-covalent lassos are, are much more common than knots in protein. So we built a data set of almost 17,000 protein domains, so this analysis was carried out at the level of domains, a non-redundant one, 
and essentially one third of such proteins host at least one entangled loop, according to our definition. So this is the very uh, point. An example of this, uh, a gallery of uh, uh, entangled structures hosting uh, non-covalent lasers, so a reasonable, reasonably small one, so you see the red loop with the blue thread. This is the, the world champion, so this is the most extreme case that we found with uh, a minus three link, generalized linking number. Okay, so you see the blue portion is threading three times with, uh, uh, through this red loop. Here I want to point out the fact that <coughs> this is essentially it's the same structure, so a given structure can host more than one entangled motif, and in this case the two entangled motifs are characterized by opposite chiralities, by different signs of the generalized linking number. Now, uh, we looked uh, at uh, the sequence patterns that we find at the end of entangled loops, what I will call entangled contacts. Now, let me explain a little bit what, we, what this plot means. So, each point in the plot refers to a given amino acid, amino acid pair. So, we have 210 of them. On the y-axis, we use knowledge-based potentials. We already heard about uh, statistical potentials or knowledge-based potential, I, I think, yesterday morning. So essentially this number is, is a measure of how enriched a given amino acid pair is found in the ensemble of all contacts, of all native contacts, uh, with respect to some reference state. <coughs> I will not tell you in detail what reference state we chose. The point is the lower this number, the more enriched we find that given pair of amino acid types in the ensemble of all <coughs> contacts. On the y-axis, we measure the energy difference when we restrain the analysis to the set of entangled contacts. Okay? So you can see we find an anti-correlation, so it's sort of weak, but it's actually statistically significant. And what this anti-correlation anti means Let's look at the paradigmatic case of system system. So system system pairs, of course, are the one which are found more enriched in the set of all contacts, exactly because they form disulfide bridges. But they are less, the one that are more or less enriched, let's say, in the set of entangled contacts. Okay, so this anti-correlation means that entangled contacts are on average significantly weaker or less stable, if you wish, destabilized with respect to typically, typical native contacts. Of course, as I said, the correlation is weak, and so there are exceptions to this pattern. Look at this area here. Notably, and this is just an empirical observation, uh, aromatic, aromatic contacts all belong to this area. Okay, so they are found even more enriched <coughs> at uh, the end of entangled loops. So our interpretation of this anti-correlation is that some amount of native energetic frustration, destabilizing native contacts, is needed to counter the topological frustration which is due to the presence of an entangled loop in the native structure. Okay, so then we looked at the position of the thread with respect to the loop in entangled loop. So the thread could be <coughs> present either on the N-terminal side of the loop or on the C-terminal side of the loop. So if, if we look for all loops, so without the condition of having entangled loops, we find the thread with equal probability on both sides. But if we look only for entangled loops, we find, again, a weak preference, but still significant, for what we call N-terminal thread. So the thread is on the N-terminal side. So this observation, together with the previous one, suggests to us this hypothesis. So the idea is that uh, a way to cope for the folding process to occur, to cope with the presence of uh, an, an entangled loop, is to have, on average, 
a late formation of entangled contacts during the folding process. So in other words, if you want to form a lasso, you first put in place the thread and then you bundle the, the loop around it. This should be easier, also intuitively, than first forming the contact and then threading through, uh, through the loop. Actually, this kind of idea was already put out in this very old paper by the uh, Krippen group. Okay, how much time do we have? Uh, 10 minutes, okay. So, uh, an interesting point is that this preference for N-terminal thread is coupled with a preference for chirality, okay? So, this is a distribution of the Link, generalized link number for all loops in our data set and you see this bump for the red curve for n terminal thread is present only for the posit on the positive chirality uh, side we don't have any real explanation for this a possible speculation uh, due to the fact that this is coupled to the asymmetry of a position of the, of the thread with respect to a loop is that this might reflect a signature of the, the way the uh, nascent chain is coming out of a ribosome during cotranslational folding. Now, a quick tour about membrane proteins. So, when I asked my student to, to Leonardo to, to look for uh, the presence of entanglements in membrane proteins was actually thinking he would find none or very few. And to our surprise, they are also commonly present in non-covalent lassos are also commonly present in membrane proteins. Just look at this plot. So as a function of the uh, generalized linking number, so the, re the black curve refers to the reference globular protein case, the one we just, I just discussed. So you have a one, one third here. For transmembrane proteins, we have that a little bit less, but still 20% of membrane protein, do uh, membrane protein domains host a non-covalent lasso. Also, uh, we found a specific chirality pattern, specific for membrane proteins, which is different from the one that I just showed to you in the case of globular proteins. So now globular proteins are shown here. This is a different way. So essentially this peak, so the different colors and symbols refers to the C thread or N thread case, positive or negative chirality. So the peak for this black curve signals the preference for uh, N thread with positive chirality, we just discussed. But you see for globular proteins, so this is what happens for, let's say, in the case of single winding motifs, when the generalized linking number is one. But if we look at what happens for uh, cases where we uh, are dealing with double winding motifs with ger generalized linking number of two, okay, then you see you have a switch for the globular proteins and um, negative chirality and uh, non-covalent lassos takes over. We don't observe this from, for trans, transmembrane proteins, although admittedly now here we are coping with uh, lack of structures in our data set. But uh, again, this is a speculation. This again might be due to the fact that uh, the machineries involved in the biogenesis of membrane proteins is of course different and more complicated uh, with respect to the one that is taking care of global proteins. proteins. In this ni very nice review, you, you can find a whole discussion about possible multi-pass, translocon for multi-pass, transmembrane proteins, and the nascent chain is getting out of the ribosome, and then it is inserted in all sorts of vestibule or lateral gates in order to be folded, to be passed through the membrane multiple times. And again, our speculation is that this thing is leaving a signature in the presence of, of this specific uh, uh, chirality pattern in entangled motifs. Just an example of uh, uh, entangled motifs in uh, membrane <coughs> proteins. For example, this is a transporter with a doubly, doubly winding motifs. And just a quick 
So this is one chain from an outer, so this is a bacterial membrane protein from the outer membrane channel, okay? And this is an example where, again, you see two different uh, coexisting uh, uh, non-covalent lassos. Now, uh, so you might ask yourself at this point, why should we care about uh, entangled motifs? The point is, a very recent work by the group of Ed O'Brien in Penn State uh, is suggesting that uh, uh, the ability of uh, proteins, especially in, for nascent chains in the context of, of uh, translation on the ribosome, to populate different states which are misfolded could actually be of biological relevance. So the point is that uh, these misfolded states are misfolded due to what I call misentanglement. Okay, so they form and uh, they have entanglement properties, a presence or absence of uh, non-covalent lassos, which with different, with different properties with respect to the native state. On the other hand, they are misfolded, and therefore I, uh, they are less functional than the native state. But on the other hand, they are otherwise very close to the native structure. Okay, so they are compact structure, uh, shielding the hydrophobic uh, core within, and so they are, cannot be identified by chaperons by the protein quality control system. Okay, so let me skip this other thing. So what we did was to to take a very small uh, protein hosting an entangled motif, you can see here. So this is the, end, the thread just at the end terminal side, threading through the red loop. This is a 64 residue, it's an anti-freeze protein. And we use, uh, we do, devised, I will not enter it into detail, uh, um, uh, an entanglement indicator. So this is a number attached to any given conformation of that protein. And we use a coarse-grained uh, structure-based model, based at coarse-grained at C alpha level, a seminal work by Cecilia Clementi and Professor Onucic here, with large Venn dynamics. And essentially, this will be my last slide. And what we see here is uh, a plot where we put together all the information that we get from a whole ensemble of refolding trajectories. So this is not, so it's plot like a free energy contour plot, but it is not because this is uh, not an equilibrium plot. And what we observe is, okay, so we have used two reaction coordinates, the fraction of native contacts which are formed, and this entanglement indicator. So we start from an unfolded structure with no entanglement formed, and a few native contacts which are formed, and then here we have a folded structure with a negative <coughs> chirality entanglement formed, and most of native contacts formed. The point is we find two alternative folding pathway, a fast pathway, which is fast because it goes through this short-lived intermediate, which is non-compact, as you can see, so it, it has just a little bit more contact with respect to the unfolded initial state, but where the native entanglement is already formed. On the other hand, we observe, uh, you see, highly populated, so a long-lived kinetic trap, where, which is almost as, co as compact, it's very similar to the folded state, you see here, before this stage, you see the blue thread going through the red loop. Here, all the rest of the structure is close to native, but the blue and terminal uh, side is not threading through the red loop. And so we observe, even in this uh, small protein, a presence of a very native-like, compact, but non, so with uh, intermediate, which acts as a kinetic trap, but uh, uh, it is not, not native because the entanglement properties are different from the native state. So let me go to conclusions. So what I told you today is that entangled motifs, non-covalent lassos are common in protein structures, that native energetic frustration is needed apparently to counter topological frustration, 
there are chirality patterns which are specific for membrane proteins associated to the presence of non-convalent lassos. We do observe mesentangle close to native intermediates, even for very short proteins, which I didn't tell you. Typically, one would expect to just uh, conform to the two-state behavior. And we observe entangle, entangle motifs already formed in non-combat configurations. Then we would like to, to, to confirm all this by using volaton simulations, maybe have a look at what would be the role of, of, fold, of co-translational folding, the role on non-native interactions. <coughs> uh, in the case of membrane proteins, it would be nice to take advantage of other fold structure to get more statistics. And of course, a very big question is, are these motifs conserved? What is their function? and would like to work on this in the future. So let me thank all of you for your attention. Uh, how do you select the thread? How do you select the thread? Select. Select. The, no, I don't select it. We, we, well, it's optima, I mean, it's the result of, of an optimization process. So given the loop, we look for the thread of, among all possible length. Yeah, with some constraint on the length. It's, it's constraint so, of course, uh, we, there is a constraint in the position in the sequence with respect to the loop, so there has to be some pace along the sequence between the thread and the loop, and then it has to be at least uh, 10 residues long. But apart from that, we look for all possible such threads, and we look for the one that is maximizing the generalized linking number. I don't know, that would be great. Well, okay. Uh, well, as I said, the expectation is no, which is some, somehow what I said before, because the idea, again, is, see, there was one talk before the coffee break about some extended misfolded conform, some, let's say, misfolded conformation exposing <laughs> hydrophobic patches. So that kind of misfolded states are prone to be detected by chaperones. This kind of... Uh, all the intermediates. Uh, the point, the, the, the point is, they are, they don't expose. I, okay, we may expect they don't expose hydrophobic patches, and therefore we expect them not to be detected by chaperones. But okay, in the paper by the Ed O'Brien, by Ed O'Brien group, uh, you, you you can find a, a bioinformatic analysis along these lines. Sure. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if what I'm going to say is going to answer your question. Uh, so you're referring to non to the role on yes. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay, as far as I understand, in the context of knots and slip knots, you can find very different behavior. Okay, you can find uh, early knot formation or <coughs> or all kind. So I agree with you that uh, some of the behavior I mean, that you present, that you studied in your many works, uh, 
could be akin to, 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 to this mechanism. On the other hand, I would say that slip knots are different from this kind of uh, non-covalent lassos, but yes. Uh, Also, I, I, I should say, I mean, this is just one specific example, uh, and of course one should look at more and more proteins, maybe changing the protein would completely change the mechanism, uh, as it happens for knots. Okay. Okay, you guys hear me okay? All right, good afternoon everybody. My name is Andy Rodriguez. I work with uh, Simon Magri and Megan King over in Yale. Um, today, I'll be talking to you about some early stages for a project we've been working on over the last year or so. Um, and the title of the talk is Developing a Maximum Likelihood Framework for uh, Measuring Chromatin Configurational Dynamics in Live Cells. And uh, so quick outline, I'll give you just a quick intro. We've heard a lot about uh, DNA within the nucleus, but I'll give you a little state of the field for chromatin configuration research. I'll go into our methodology, uh, for specifically the fluorescence microscopy we've been developing, um, and then how we plan on using the, that fluorescence microscopy data, and then uh, finally show you some early results and some conclusions. So uh, I think we're all tired of this slide, but I do want to come up and, uh, you know, recontextualize some of this. Um, so we've heard a lot about specifically uh, loop extrusion factors, uh, topologically associated domains, and a little bit about compartmentalization. Um, but something that hasn't really been mentioned, uh, it's been alluded to a little bit, is that these are dynamic processes, right? Loop extrusion is extremely transient. Topologically associated domains, due to the transience of loop extrusion, are actually quite dynamic. And then uh, when it comes down to compartmentalization, there are actually two types of compartments. Um, there's euchromatin, heterochromatin. Euchromatin is less densely packed together, and in these regions, genes are expressed much more actively. Um, and then in heterochromatin, where uh, DNA is much more densely packed, these are regions that don't have genes that are actively transcribed. Um, but when a gene is regulated, turned on or off, it can actually uh, move in between these sorts of compartments. Um, and so what I want to, you know, really hammer home here is that there is a dynamics component that really hasn't been talked about much at all today. So, uh, again, I don't really need to go over this too much. Uh, we've heard a lot about high c It's a statistical methodology, and it's really, uh, you know, defined this field as a whole. But, um, you know, there's this implied ergodicity issue where uh, really it's struggling to take these ensemble measurements and, and relay them back into single cell um, and single cell back into ensemble. And um, so because of this, you know, looking at single cell data is, is important. Uh, and it doesn't have any sort of time components involved. And similarly, uh, with current imaging techniques, specifically FISH, while you can make beautiful images using super resolution and multiplexing, um, the issue is that these almost all require fixed cells. So we lose that time component. Uh, so that's where I want to jump into what we're planning on doing. So, our model organism is S. Pombi. Uh, our labeling technique is uh, LACO, LACI operators. So we insert these LACO arrays, which are just repeating sequences of the LACO gene. And then we constitutively express LACI GFP, which allows us to create a tunable fluorescent locus because uh, each LACI will come and bind a single LACO repeat. So depending on how big we make these repeat sequences, we can tune the fluorescence. Uh, and then we can insert uh, these individual locus across the genome at semi-regular intervals. So this gives us a basically sparsely labeled entire chromosome to look at. Uh, and then we can do some sort of nuclear landmark labeling, right? So if we want to take a look at single cells, we need a way to translate that data from one cell to another. The way we can do that in S. Pombi is first off, we label the nuclear envelope. That's very straightforward. Uh, but we also label the spindle pole body. And for those who are a little unfamiliar with S. Pombi genomics, the spindle pole body, I like to think of it as sort of a north star. Uh, all of the chromosomes are actually anchored to it at one point. And it forms this really nice oscillatory back and forth motion, which you'll see in the videos that are coming up. Uh, and I'd like to point out, this is a very classical depiction of S. Pombi uh, chromosomes. 
it's, uh, you know, it's a cartoon, so it's simplified, but it gives a little bit of misinformation here. If you look at this, you know, s prime chromosomes are, or uh, nuclei are something on the order of a couple of microns. Um, so if you see this, you know, you might think that the, the chromatin is in some sort of extended conformation, and there's maybe a few microns worth of DNA in there. In actuality, there are tens of microns of DNA. It's, it's jam-packed in there. So this extended conformation is a little misleading. Um, so, right, we have this very simplistic uh, labeling technique of using multiple, or of using lac o lac i. So how do we take this and, and translate it into coarse graining chromatin dynamics for a whole chromosome? Well, what essentially what we're setting up here is a guessing game, a, a game of connect the dots. So say we have a cell and we're expressing some number of spots. We can follow the trajectory of those spots through time, and the idea is then to try to reconstruct the underlying polymer that connects these dots. And we can do that through time as well. And then what we end up with then is the actual chromatin conformation, of course on a coarse grain resolution, of uh, that actual cell that, it was, that we were measuring. So this is what the data actually looks like. Uh, this is basically a year and a half worth of, of genetics that we've been working on. Um, so what we have is about 10 unique genes uh, labeled across chromosome 2 of S. pombi. Uh, chromosome 2 is about 4.5 megabases. You can see the gene map here. Uh, these are those tunable fluorescence intensities I was talking about. Really, we have uh, three distinguishable fluorescence int intensities that we can see. And what this allows us to do is basically have three distinct labels that we can visualize using just one optical channel. Um, and then we can insert uh, a couple of these fluorescent labels into a singular strain and express them simultaneously so they can be visualized simultaneously. And that's what you're seeing here uh, in this video. So what you should see is five genomic loci wiggling around in there, right? That is the short arm of chromosome two uh, outlined. And uh, depending on how good your eyes are, you might be able to find a couple of cells where you can see all five spots jiggling back and forth. Um, but you might not always. And the reason why that is is because this is actually a maximum intensity projection. The data we take is actually in three dimensions. It's wide field Z stack slicing. So um, this additional third dimension of Z actually gives us a lot better resolution when trying to identify all five of these spots that are actually fairly densely labeled together. And then on the right here, uh, once it resets, there you go. Uh, so M-Cherry obviously has a bit of a bleaching problem, but um, you can see the nuclear envelope label around these nuclei, and then you can watch our spindle pole bodies oscillate back and forth. So um, how do we want to start playing our connect the dots game, right? This is the kind of crux of the idea of what we're trying to propose. And the idea here is that genomic closeness translates to a higher probability for physical closeness within a polymer chain. That's the very fundamental idea of this. So the idea again, say we have some labeling scheme using our multiple tunable fluorescent loci. Uh, so say we have some very bright spot, then some slightly less bright, and then some dim spot, and then we repeat that sequence. Well. We can try to connect those dots using that sort of imposed labeling scheme, and when we do so, there's some probability we can associate for the likeliness of that confirmation. Uh, somewhat intuitively, you might think that, you know, probably the most likely configuration is the one that's the most straightforward. It minimizes the distance between these spots. And these ones where you have maybe some crazy loop that goes out this way or kind of crisscrosses all over each other is quite unlikely. So that's the basis of the idea, but don't forget that we're looking at dynamics here, right? So we can re-involve our time evolution to kind of converge on our idea, right? So if we take two independent configurations uh, and some delta t away, whatever that might be, and we find whatever the most probable configuration is, we can then converge through time, and as we converge through time, we should converge on the right confirmation and watch it develop, essentially. Now, um, this idea of genomic closeness actually translates very straightforwardly into the mathematics in the sense that all we really need to do is uh, the most likely chromatin confirmation is that which minimizes the mean squared separation between loci pairs across the polymer. Uh, and what this basically tells us is even if we're expressing eight loci that are, identi are, are labeled completely ambiguously, we, we don't know their identities at all, um, if we sample them through enough time, if we look at eight independent samples, for example, um, we can guess their identities with 95% accuracy. But, you know, we don't really know what independent samples means right now, so how can we kind of increase our chances of making this guessing game even higher? Uh, so what kind of information can we uh, come up with to, to, to really contextualize these specific genes? Um, and something that we discovered early on is that each of these genes actually has a gene-specific nuclear localization, which was quite unexpected. But how you can read this data, it's quite a dense slide. 
So here we have our map of chromosome two. This red dot here marks the spinopole body. Remember the spinopole body is that nice oscillatory motion back and forth. SEN2, this gene, is right next to the spinopole body. So it localizes very strongly at this sort of north star. And then if you follow the blue arrows, you can follow up the short arm of chromosome two. And if you follow the yellow arrows, you can follow the long arm of chromosome two. And what I really want you to take away from this slide though, is that as we move away from the spinopole body, um, genes have very characteristic and specific localization patterns, right? Genes that are near it tend to, tend to occupy nearby, that might be intuitive. But as you go farther out, you see uh, different localization patterns and where it likes to, to hang out. This is a little counterintuitive, right? When I uh, told you about this, this cartoon earlier, there's a lot of DNA in the cell. Because there's so much DNA, um, you would expect you know, a, a singular loci within a chromosome to kind of take a random walk on formation, right? Even with some driven parameters, you would expect that most actually sample, you know, a pretty, pretty good sequence or a pretty, pretty uh, random walk. But that's not really what we're seeing. Instead, what we're seeing is actually a little bit more reminiscent of something like chromosome territories, which was a little unexpected. Um, okay, so with that, I'll just go quickly into how we plan on expanding this technique. So uh, those localization maps I just showed you are in two dimensions. Um, so we're lacking that third dimension that I, I really want to incorporate into this. And the way we can do that is using uh, cell morphology. So uh, I think in the last couple of days, you guys have seen this sort of cell segmentation workflow idea. Again, the idea is just to uh, segment your cells and be able to extract uh, the morphology and size of those cells in, white, in bright field. And this allows us both to assess the cell state. So based on cell size, we can determine whether it's you know, mitotic, interface. Um, and then we can look at the morphology. And using that morphology, we can use the long axis of the cell to define one of our uh, angles. And then we can also take a look at the nucleus. And uh, using the YZ projection, uh, spin the nucleus so that our spindle pole body oscillations are always in frame. So basically, we can define our axes by just these two angles, alpha and theta. So with that, we can uh, start to do reconstructions in three dimensions. And this is um, really the advancements we've made in the last couple of months. Uh, thanks to my colleague, Jenny Tian, she's been able to do a nuclear envelope reconstruction using that nuclear envelope marker. And she can place the spindle pole body moving across that surface. Uh, and then she can place genomic uh, locus within that three-dimensional volume. And then on the right here, this is some work by our undergraduate, Michael Sachs. Um, he was doing, so the idea, uh, one of the advantages of doing this cell segmentation workflow is that it allows us to do per nuclei Gaussian fitting. So when we're trying to impose, you know, five spots simultaneously, um, what we really need is the ability to tell whatever Gaussian fitting algorithm that it should be looking for five spots. Otherwise, it's, it's quite a struggle. Um, so by doing this, in this case, you should be visualizing two genomic loci. Sometimes the spots will come within too close of a physical distance um, and they can't be resolved anymore. But using this sort of algorithm, it lets us uh, start troubleshooting through those problems. So with that, I'll just wrap up. So we're using this lac lac IGFP operator to track multiple fluorescent loci in three dimensions in live single cells. And uh, we're working on constructing this maximum likelihood approach to uh, reconstruct coarse grain chromatin polymer uh, dynamics from actual live cells of s uh, We have some ongoing work, which I showed you. And then the idea is, uh, as this project develops, to do critical depletion assays with uh, important factors such as RAD21 for loop extrusion and uh, remodelers like Eno80. So thank you, and I'll take questions. Multiple chromosomes. Uh, yeah, in theory it should. Um, really the kind of defining issue is how well these loci are going to be resolvable as you increase the density. Um, if I go back to that video, I think you can see that, uh, you know, even when we're doing that maximum intensity projection, uh, I skipped it. Uh, even when we're doing that maximum intensity projection, it can be pretty hard to spot these guys. Um, so if you wanted to do multiple chromosomes, really it just comes down to how many of these you want to visualize simultaneously. That's a fair point. Yeah. Uh, one of the, actually one of the interesting things about this project, and SPOMI in particular, is uh, because of this sort of two-arm system, 
right? The anchor point is here, and you're visualizing one of these arms. So it'll be interesting to see how you know the separate arm correlates. Right now, our lab is just using a pretty basic Rouse polymer model. Um, I think we're looking into going into uh, volume exclusion models as we develop that side of the lab. But as of right now, it's Rouse polymer. I've seen a little bit of it. I believe they were looking at, I think, two spots simultaneously. I don't think they've done anything more than two spots. Yeah, I, I'm vaguely familiar with the paper. I mean, yeah, I, what we're looking at is highly dynamic, and of course there's single cell variation. So, um, I mean, if you're talking about looking at the same trajectories and trying to do re multiple reconstructions. Um, or, or, or looking at different trajectories and see how different they are. Or yeah. Different with these trajectories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, so obviously looking at cross cells is one of the, the very obvious you know, implications that we want to use this for. Looking at that cell-to-cell -cell variability I think is very important for what we want to do. Um, as far as the actual reconstructions go and whether we would get different results looking at the same trajectories but doing re multiple reconstructions, uh, I think that comes down to really how we define what the resolution is, right? If we're getting multiple different reconstructions from t one trajectory, I think really that's just a confidence problem. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Thank you. I brought it yeah, just yeah, in just yeah, <laughs> Yeah, hello everyone, my name is Mateus Melo and I'm a graduate student at Professor Ownership Group. And today I'll be presenting on my work on reorganization dynamics uh, in whole genome simulations. So at this point we've already seen this uh, exactly image before. So I just uh, want to highlight the hierarch hierarchical structure of the nucleus. Uh, the DNA wraps around the histones and from the chromatin fiber, and this fiber can form loops, can form the tads and the, the domains that we see, and also the compartments. 
uh, finally arriving at the chromosome territories. So these chromosomes, we know that they don't uh, significantly mix with one another. And I just wanted to highlight that our talk today is going to focus mainly on this uh, landscape. So with that in mind, our group has previously proposed a minimum chromatin model, which basically models the chromosome uh, with a holo uh, polymeric backbone in which we add three different uh, assumptions. The first one is that we color our polymer uh, by the compartments or subcompartments here. We'll be using the subcompartments, and we can see this as just a proxy for uh, transcription activity. Uh, and this term basically uh, sets the stickiness between the, the, the pair interactions uh, by its compartments. We also have another interaction term for the loop anchors. So we know that some, uh, certain loci, they form loops, uh, and we see in high experiments. So we also have an additional interaction for modeling that. And finally, we have uh, the ideal chromosome term, which is a lengthwise compaction. Uh, initially, it was a data-driven term, but we later associated with the action of loop, er, loop extruders in the, in the polymer. So this model has been now uh, extensively used, and it was also used to analyze dynamics, but mainly for single and uh, two chromosomes, and we're now trying to expand this to looking at the whole 46 human chromosomes. So our simulation setup, we start by the subcompartment sequence and the position of the loops that we get from experiments, and we do a short single chromosome simulation just to get a uh, collapse the structure. Uh, we then use this collapse structure to initiate our uh, full uh, 46 chromosome simulation. Uh, and to try to uh, validate it against experimental data, we can first look at the uh, whole genome uh, high C map, and we see that the intensity of the intrachromosomal maps is much higher than the interchromosomal maps, thus uh, showing the formation of the territories. We can then focus on the intrachromosomal maps uh, for both, for example, here I have chromosomes 2 and 19, which is a big and a small uh, chromosome, respectively. And we also see that we also recaptured the uh, plaid pattern. And finally, I'm showing an example of the intrachromosomal interaction between chromosomes 6 and 12. Uh, instead of showing the contact matrix here, I'm showing the correlation matrix. And we see that here, uh, Red is correlation and uh, blue is anti-correlation and we see correlation whenever two A uh, compartments come together and anti or two B and anti-correlation whenever we have a A B contact. So we are basically using the system to look at the uh, time scales of reorganization at different uh, length scales. So here I'm showing uh, the dynamics of different uh, aspects of uh, of our system. We have the uh, center of mass of the territories. We have all the, the uh, B3 subcompartment in chromosome 10, and we also have just a segment of B3 uh, in, also in chromosome 10. And to sort of like measure the, the characteristic time scales of these uh, reorganizations, we chose to look at the relaxation of the similarity, which is the, the Q uh, commonly used for proteins. Um, and see, we see that for each one of these uh, length scales, we sample uh, different uh, time scales. We measure this by comparing the decay until we, uh, the similarity reaches the value of different replicas. Uh, and we see that basically for the territories, we see a minimum time scale in the uh, range of like uh, tens of hours. Uh, if we do the conversion from our simulated uh, reduced unit to uh, actual unit, for the reorganization of the subcompartments inside the chromosome, we see a time scale uh, from a, a couple of hours. And uh, finally, for the segment, we see a much smaller time scale of just like a couple minutes. Uh, so this work, it's going to probably be out soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. And with that, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my PI and the other authors of this paper, also the uh, all the grand Grand, grand sources, and I also added my email in case anyone wants to ask a question. And thank you.
Yeah, yeah. Never yes, and it, it, this has also been seen like experimentally. Um, one like early paper by Kramer, they kind of like track the territories throughout a cell cycle, and they see they mainly remain like in the same localization throughout the, the same cell cycle. So, uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm a PhD student at the uh, University of uh, Milan, and so today I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work on the modeling of uh, chromatin dynamics. So, uh, here we go again. Um, chromatin is this uh, long polymer uh, made of uh, DNA and proteins that we find in the cells. Uh, in this uh, specific work, uh, we focused on the dynamics of uh, the interchain contacts at the megabase scale uh, using a um, combination of uh, uh, polymeric models and the molecular dynamics of simulations. Uh, the biological motivation behind this is that uh, contacts at this scale are uh, thought to be crucial for the control of gene activation. Now, um, the formation and stabilization of contacts at uh, this scale is uh, driven by this process called the group extrusion. Now you probably know uh, everything about group extrusion, so uh, very briefly, uh, it is driven by this uh, protein complex uh, named uh, uh, coisin uh, that is uh, ring-shaped. Coisin uh, binds to the chromatin fiber, then it uh, slides, uh, uh, forming these loops and then eventually can unbind. So of course this uh, process is impacting the dynamics of contacts and uh, we expect to be able to distinguish between thermal contacts and uh, uh, loop extrusion driven contacts. So what we do, uh, we fix a certain uh, contact cutoff, so a distance that defines the contact. We also define a genomic distance and then we look at the frequency of contact duration in experiments and in simulations. Uh, in experiments, you see uh, when coisin is uh, suppressed, you basically have uh, uh, just one single exponential decay, while when coisin is present, uh, we have a complex, more complex behavior that is well described by a double exponential shape. In particular, we have this uh, tail of long-lasting contacts that are enhanced. Uh, molecular dynamics simulations basically confirm this uh, fact. Uh, when coisin is present, we have uh, this uh, tail of long-lasting contacts. And we wanted to get some kind of uh, information on the loop extrusion process from this uh, data. And so uh, there are several problems. And one, one of these is that the time resolution in experiments is not so good. It's around 10 seconds. And uh, so, of course, uh, the time scales we are uh, looking at in the distributions are uh, in a way overestimated. So what can we do? What we did was uh, introducing a, a, an analytical model based on a Markov chain that describes the formation and disruption of contacts in chromatin. Unfortunately, there is no time to go into details about the models, but you can trust me that the model is able to explain the experimental results, meaning that we get uh, the uh, distribution as a sum of uh, two exponentials, and also uh, uh, it explains how time resolution is able to modify uh, the time scales observed. Now, uh, what we did was to compute these different time scales of the uh, slow uh, contacts dynamics for different cutoff, and you see a linear relationship in the simulations and in experiment. This means that in a way, uh, the motion of disruption can be seen as a uniform motion, and the effective velocity that you get from this in simulations is exactly the stepping rate of uh, the extrusion that was uh, set at the beginning of the simulation. And if we apply this same line of reasoning on the experiment, we can get an exp um, 
an effective velocity that is in a way an estimate, actually a lower bound of the cohesion extrusion speed in the experiment that we found to be around 0.1 kilobits per second. That is not far from some recent findings in experiments in vivo. So this was our main findings. Uh, I just now thank my supervisor, uh, Guido Tiana, and Luca Giorgetti and its lab that are doing these experiments in Basel, and of course you for your attention. Uh, well, um, here, you mean in the experiments, of course. Uh, here we had. No, uh, actually, we, here. Uh, we didn't exactly evaluate the error because, uh, I mean, it, it's the, it's basically the slope of this uh, this curve. Uh, actually, we didn't evaluate. I think it, it should be around uh, probably 20, 30 percent of these, something like this. Probably. Hello. Hello everyone, I'm Vittor Scolari, I come from Institut Curie, that is a, a cancer institute in Paris founded by two pioneers of nuclear physics, Pierre and Marie Curie, and uh, it's an institute where we have a physics unit uh, that we do theoretical experiment basically on uh, many topics that are covered by this conference, uh, and in this institute there is also a nuclear dynamics unit where we focus on the dynamics of things happening at this level inside the nucleus, but the cell nucleus. And, um, like I'm in the lab of uh, Anton Coulonne, where, uh, where uh, we, we pull chromatine, as has been uh, said before. And uh, just to reply to your question to Samuele, like uh, our result is that uh, the dynamics follows largely the round law for all single locus that we tested. And I have to give two other replies. First, these have not been yet replicated anywhere. And second, that this has never been coupled to force, uh, force sensor that he was kind of uh, hinting before. So be my guest. And, uh, and uh, but today I will talk to you about uh, another project. There is a project with Angela today where we work uh, in yeast. And the yeast is a very interesting uh, uh, organism where the cell is well, the, the chromatin configuration is well known. There's a symmetry between the spindle body and the nucleolus. The chromosomal arm go inside the nucleus and then uh, end up at, uh, at the nuclear interface, uh, more or less. And this has been confirmed by uh, content maps. And we are particularly interested in this project about uh, the heterochromatic foci as the telomere because, uh, first of all, they're heterochromatin and they follow a very classical uh, reader-writer pro uh, pro uh, pro programming of the chromatin. And second, they form a cluster that can be visible uh, with super-resolution microscopy. And we wonder about the nature of, uh, of this cluster. And um, the typical uh, rapidening processes which are studied in theoretical physics uh, maybe are relevant, but they don't capture uh, the, the, the key of this uh, problem because as you see, these are very dynamical clusters. And so, if anything, the parameter space uh, of interaction between telomere is highly constrained by these dynamics. And uh, they're interesting because they change along uh, the growth cycle. In particular, there are many clusters at the nuclear surface in exponential phase, and they end up with one single cluster in uh, the stationary phase after several days in the center of the cell. And on top of that, uh, there are a known uh, anchor of the, of the telomeres to the envelope, and we can change them. And we can see that in certain conditions, we can switch from this uh, to that by removing the anchors. And uh, as, as you uh, can see in the, this uh, highly quantitative uh, microscopy data, where there are hundreds of single cells, uh, we, we measure the the intensity of cluster and the number of cluster, and where there is no anchoring, you have much less cluster and they are bigger. So it is an interesting complex problem. So 
about the nucleus, why not to collaborate with Arida Nuclear Physics, which is a great uh, tester. And uh, he implemented simulation based on the Zimmer model. This is a very good model that reproduces very well uh, microscopic IC uh, data. And uh, we changed the number of bits. We did some improvement. In particular, we are focusing on the interaction between telomere and telomere that were so far totally neglected. And, uh, and uh, from our simulation, we can demonstrate that, in, in fact, the effect of wetting alone have an effect of clustering. So you're really just uh, bringing things uh, more inside by removing the anchor. Can, uh, can increase uh, the, uh, the size uh, and, uh, the, and change the distribution of number of cluster. And uh, with this, uh, I, uh, it's work in progress. And I welcome any question. Uh, and I thank uh, all my collaborators, at least uh, the one. Uh, and, uh, sorry if I forgot some. Well, this is happening at 20 nanometer, so I would say no, that's not good. Hello everybody, I'm Francesco, a PhD student from CISA, from the biophysics department. And today I would like to talk about how you can use quantum machines uh, to study soft matter systems. My focus of study are polymer melts, uh, that are collections of many polymers. These kind of systems are dense by definition, and therefore are really computationally expensive uh, to sample. For instance, if you perform a Monte Carlo simulation where you take a piece of your polymer and you move it, it is very likely that you will end up on the same chain of the same polymer or on top of another polymer. And therefore, due to self-avoidance, you will reject the move. So you have likely a very high rejection rate that translates to a really high autocorrelation time. People came up with many clever ideas to try to reduce this autocorrelation time, like some clever moves on some lattice. But uh, we decided to approach the problem from a different point of view, that is, uh, what if we use uh, an hardware that goes faster than what we usually do? So we tried to look uh, into how we can study this system using quantum machines. Uh, and. Uh, because quantum computers promise uh, to be faster than classical ones. However, the main difficulty is the fact that quantum computers don't speak the same language of classical machines. So in our study, we decided to focus on a subclass of quantum computers that are quantum annealers. And what they do is the fact that they minimize some cost function. So, what we have to do is to recast our problem from a sampling problem to a minimization one. Moreover, there are some other constraints that we have to consider. And in fact, we can say that uh, this kind of machines solve the so-called cubo problems that are optimization problems where the variables are binary. Moreover, you cannot put other uh, disequalities on top of your minimization process. And last but not least, uh, the system, the uh, cost function that you want to study must be quadratic at most. So what you do is you recast your problem as an easing system, you feed the easing system to the quantum machine, and the quantum machine will try to minimize its energy. 
and at the end of the process, we spit out a state uh, that very likely is a ground state uh, of your easing system. So the question is, uh, can we build uh, a fictitious easing system in such a way that uh, his ground states are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the configuration that we want to map? Because uh, if we are able to do so, we just have to minimize uh, the energy of this fictitious system and then we will get samples uh, of our original system. For instance, you can see here that uh, the top two configuration don't are, for instance, not self-avoiding or we have some bonds that do not end up in some monomers, so we would not like to have this configuration. And if we build correctly our Hamiltonian, we will just end up with a configuration on the bottom. So how can we build this uh, easing system? I will try to give you an idea, and we will start from a lattice. This is because uh, quantum computers are discrete uh, in their nature. So consider a cubic lattice, uh, and for simplicity, we can generalize this model to have a regular lattices, also irregular ones. And for the time being, let's just assign a binary variable to each lattice site. So a, a site will have a variable that is equal to zero if it is not occupied by a monomer, and one if there is a monomer there. Then we ask ourselves, what is a function that when it's minimized, uh, set uh, some of the monomers, on, or a given amount of, amount of monomers on the lattice? This is simply a parabola with its vertex on the given amount of monomers that we want. So if we minimize this function for n equal to eight, for instance, we will end up with a configuration that is like this one. Then we repeat our, this idea where we assign a, a binary variable to each lattice edge. We add another parabola, and then we minimize our, again our system. And we get a configuration that looks like this one. However, this is still not enough because we have a problem of before, like a bomb that does end up in an empty lattice site. So we had to need to add something else. And this is the following term that I will try to explain to you. So this is a local term, so that applies to each possible bond. So let's pick up two bonds that I'm highlighting in red. And as you can see, one bond is flanked by just one monomer, and the other is flanked by two monomers. So if you try to substitute zero and one in the variables that are appearing on the right, you will get that the bond on the top left will have a local term that is equal to one, and the one on the bottom right is equal to zero. So due to the fact that one of the local terms is not minimized, the whole configuration is an excited state, and therefore will not be spit out by, by our quantum machine. Instead, if we minimize the whole Hamiltonian, we get configuration that are like this one. We can add other terms on top of our Hamiltonian, like a term that imposes self-avoidance, another that fixes the total curvature of our system, that for a cubic lattice, pretty much consists in counting how many times a polymer does a 90 degrees turns. This can be also quite difficult and cumbersome, so I'm going to show you what is the term for self-avoidance. Just trust me that if you minimize all the previous term plus this one, you will get a uh, configuration that are like this, uh, so self-avoiding rings. Okay, this method is a bit convoluted, but uh, is it worth it to do it? So we looked uh, into if there are some conditions where this method can be uh, an alternative to Monte Carlo, uh, even when we do uh, classical simulations. So we decided to sample space filling configuration for the case of stiff polymers with very high bending rigidity. This is not just uh, difficult to do because we are in a dense regime, but we also have the bending rigidity that increase our rejection rate. And what we did was to implement uh, Monte Carlo with some replica exchange method where the metabolism hosting rules were uh, specific for our given cubic lattice. And as you can see, uh, we compared our result to some classical minimization and we obtain that uh, if we go to big sizes, uh, we have that uh, these methods performs well with more traditional ones. So we were satisfied, and then we asked uh, ourselves, 
okay, we develop this method uh, to be run on quantum computer. How it is? Uh, I'm showing you what happens if, as a naive user, like uh, could be me, but uh, I'm not an expert of quantum computers, if I run this model on a quantum computer without optimizing anything, and I do the same uh, with a classical simulation. And as you can see from the plot on the left, uh, running this model on a quantum computer is way faster. Moreover, I am showing you on the right uh, mo some uh, more optimized model from a resource point of view to show you what are the sizes that you can obtain uh, with state-of-the-art uh, quantum computers right now the, that are cubes like uh, 11 times 11 times 10 that are starting to become enough big uh, to be relevant. But I want to highlight uh, that uh, right now quantum computers are following some sort of Moore's law. So the amount of resources that they have uh, are increasing each year. So we should expect in the near future to have uh, an big enough computers to also increase the size of our simulation. I want to conclude with some uh, physical results. So our method uh, pretty much samples well uh, melts of rings. So we decided to study the case where we have space filling rings and we look at some topological properties like the linking probability. That is the probability that, that, uh, if we, that we found some rings that are concatenated. We studied uh, this property as function of the size that we have uh, and also as function of the curvature. And as you can see on the top panel, we have that the linking probability increases uh, as we increase the size of our system. But this makes sense because uh, in a, our model pretty much is a self-assembly model. So if we increase the size, uh, we should expect, uh, first of all, more space for rings uh, to be concatenated, uh, but also more rings. Uh. Then in the bottom panel, we studied what happens if we fix the size uh, and instead we change the total curvature. That is a quantity that uh, we can easily fix uh, with our model. And I want to let you think that uh, the total curvature of our system is pretty much the conjugate quant quantity with respect to the band rigidity. So you can look at this graph by flipping the x-axis, so you are looking pretty much qualitatively at the band rigidity. And as you can see, if you go to lower uh, total curvature towards the left, uh, linking probability increases, but then it drops. And this was a bit surprising at first, uh, but makes sense. Uh, because uh, if you want to concatenate rings, uh, you need them to be a bit open. So if you have uh, low bending rigidity, each ring will pretty much wiggle around uh, and will not have space to compenetrate each other. But if they are a bit open, you have a possibility to concatenate, uh, but at the same time, you don't want them to be too much open. Both because uh, they don't close, so they don't concatenate, but also because uh, we are in a space filling configuration. So we want to, they will just stay at the borders. They don't concatenate each other. So this is pretty much it. So if you have questions, I'm welcome. Okay, we, so we don't, we work in an ensemble where we cannot uh, control the amount of rings. Uh, so we just looked uh, if there were pair of rings uh, that were concatenated. Uh, and we define the wool microstate uh, as a microstate with some linked configuration. We, yeah. Okay, so um, what we get are pretty much independent samples. Uh, so we are directly pretty much sampling the equilibrium distribution. We are not mimicking any dynamics. Uh, so we just perform our minimization, get our configuration, uh, and then we do the topological study. And then after we assign, tell to each configuration if it is linked or not, uh, we just calculate the probability. Exactly. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, the data that you're seeing here, no, because uh, right now I didn't have enough time <laughs> because uh, they don't give much time, but uh, the performance here that I show you before, the ones that uh, oh, I obtained here, are run on the D-Wave uh, quantum annealer. Okay. Okay, we look just a bit into not in probability in the case of uh, Hamiltonian walks because uh, uh, and Hamiltonian cycles. So that meant for us uh, discard, keeping track only of single uh, rings, uh, for instance. Uh, and uh, in that case, we saw that we were compatible with uh, not improbabilities obtained uh, previously. I don't know if it answered your question. Okay. Yeah, the main problem is that uh, we, with this method, uh, with the fact that they are kind of sample assembly, you cannot uh, fix uh, how many rings uh, you get, so also the length uh, cannot be fixed. Uh, so we thought about it, uh, but then we decided to uh, take our quantities like uh, how, how does it scale the number of rings as a function of the size, uh, but we could do 